morning, everyone. We're really pleased to welcome you today to the second in a series of three uh, webinars that we're um, putting on um, with Janice Tullock, um, the director of Janice Tullock and Associates. And the topic today is thinking about collections development policies. Um, and some of you who may have been along to the first webinar um, might remember that I mentioned we're planning on offering some follow-up um, support in relation to collections development and accreditation. So we'll be in touch with you afterwards to find out a bit more about whether or not you'd be interested in being involved in this and any sort of topics that you'd like to cover. Um, and without further ado, I'll pass you on to Janice so she can give you background on, on herself and her experience and also um, what we're going to be looking at today. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, I'm hoping that you can see me okay um, in this wonderful surroundings of this National Trust background that I have. As you can see, this is not my house. Um, I feel I have to explain this straight at the start. But good morning and thank you for joining me. Um, I'm hoping that you can see me as the main speaker. Um, and that will be straightforward. Okay, um, my name is Janice Simon, Archives and Heritage Consultant. Um, lovely to see a lot of you back from last week. Um, uh, my job means that I get to work with lots of different archive services and I'm providing different viewpoints on challenges, helping them to support their developing programmes, um, developing audiences, fundraising, and, and managing collections, really. Um, uh, relevant to today's um, event, um, I was the co-consultant on the project to develop the UK Archive Service Accreditation, and I now sit on the Accreditation Committee. And I've worked in all sorts of different places across the UK, assessing significance, planning collections management processes. Today is the second of three webinars for the Scottish Council on Archives, exploring collections development. And um, by the end of the three sessions, I hope that you'll have begun to think about what you need to have in place for collections development and how you will progress this programme of work and have some really clear first steps in place to act. So each session will be a mix of an introduction by me and case studies by archive services, discussion, questions and answers. Uh, we're quite a big group um, here today. We're 41 so far. So but I'll try and make this as interactive as possible. Um, we're going to be joined by um, two um, people from the University of Edinburgh today and um, really interesting project that I've worked with at the university on developing their knowledge about the collections. So I'm really pleased to have Lorraine Nailing from the university who are going to talk to us um, uh, uh, towards the end of the session about the work that they've undertaken. So as I say we're quite a big group today and um, Please use the chat box to, um, to ask any questions um, and to add any information and to make any suggestions. Um, and please do introduce yourself in that chat box now. It's always really useful for everyone else to know who the other black boxes are that are on the screen and um, to know what their interests are. And then when a bit later on we go into some breakout groups, you might have a bit of an idea of the people that are around you and that you're sitting next to virtually. Um, just to um, give you another heads up, we will also use menti.com um, to communicate. So you'll find it useful to have um, Menti open. Um, I'll start off with um, a slide from Menti just to show you. Here we go. So 
Um, if you go to menti.com now um, and use the code on the top of the screen and let me know how the weather is with you, just so that we can test that the system is working. So you should be able to just go to that website um, and type in how the weather is with you at the moment. And um, that will be the number that we will use throughout or it should be fingers crossed if the technology works okay I'll just give you a second to do that brilliant we can see all those words coming up straight away uh gray and mild you know cold but bright thawing yes that's what we want uh dull and misty No one's saying snow, which this man next to us is on the slide is giving us, which is a good straight. Good start, isn't it? Yeah, overcast, mm, grey, flooding supreme, oh no, oh dear. That is not good to be flooding. I'm in the highest point in Liverpool, so we don't get much flooding here. If we do, we're all in trouble. Brilliant, and thanks for introducing yourself in the box, in the chat box, and uh, and for the feedback on the on last week's session. And hopefully, this will help you to carry on thinking about where we are. So I'm just going to give us a little countdown for the last contributions on the Menti. Um. Oh, I can just see, I think it's that sunny-ish. I like that, I like that. But we're all warm inside and that's the, the most important thing that matters. Okay, wonderful, thank you. That's, that's brilliant that that's, that's working and going ahead. Um, I'm just going to share my presentation with you now. Um, that should come up in a second. Um, okay. That's not going to be as straightforward as I thought. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. So today's session, we're going to looking at um, writing a collections policy how to approach it and what it needs to include and begin to think about how to develop your knowledge of collections. Policy writing is something I do a lot of and people often say actually the hardest thing is knowing where to start. You know um, it's like anything you need to write isn't it? Starting to write something and having a plan is the way to, to begin. Um, Let's start then with an overview of what we're going to be looking at. Because there are different people in the session today, as last week, we're going to have a review of some of the key concepts that were important from Archive Service Accreditation. We're going to talk about the difference between a plan, a policy and a procedure. We're going to talk about what the purpose is of a collections development policy, because it's, you know, why write something if you don't know what really the purpose of it is. We're going to look at who to involve. And then I'm going to outline the five steps that I usually go through when I'm thinking about writing a collections development policy. Um, and, 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 and how you and the questions you might want to ask yourself. And in all these steps, it's really useful to um, add your own contributions, your own thoughts, things that I've missed out, things that you think should be highlighted. Um, and please do do that in the chat box because that's really useful for people. After, after going through those steps, we'll talk about what to do once it's written. Um, and then um, you might then we'll take a step back to think about well what do I need to do pre to prepare <clears throat> to prepare to 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 think about um, uh, collections development and then 
um, will go nicely into the case study about developing knowledge about collections. Really interesting then to um, think, start by thinking about your, where you are with um, collections development. It'd be really useful to know um, whether you have a comprehensive collection development policy that covers all the necessary areas. So you should have um, a question up um, on your screen there that talks about do you have the, the, the um, a comprehensive question. So feel free to um, uh, put your results, your, your answers in there. That should be bringing up the results, but it isn't. I hide the image. Yeah, there we go. Oh, let's show results. There we go. Okay, wonderful. So, brilliant. <clears throat> so far, we've got 37% 37, uh, 37 of people are saying that no, they haven't got a develop, development policy. We've got 19 saying yes, but it's not approved. Uh, we've got yes, and it is improved, approved. For those who've joined us late, um, you can go to menti.com, um, add in that code, and it will bring up all the slides that we'll be using for um, our, our discussion and for sharing ideas, uh, and you can make your contributions there. Really interesting quite evenly distributed between yes and it's approved and no, and yes, but it's not approved. Um, really worrying that you've got some that aren't approved because it really needs to be approved. Although I know in some organizations, this is really tricky thing to do. Um, okay, let's just end that one there. So just one, one few seconds to add in your, your final thoughts there. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. So to recap on some of the things that we looked at last time, really key concepts in um, archive accreditation is to think about what your mission is. Um, your, and, and under archive service accreditation, a mission is the collecting organization's purpose in relation to its collection. So why do you have a collection? Why does your um, charity or your local authority or your business have a, 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 have a, have a collection? And to try and jot those four things down is what is an exercise that we did last time is what, what are the four parts to your mission? And the other, the other thing that we looked at is your community. Who is the community that your archive service is constitu constituted to serve? What do you know about that archive service? You know, that, that, not about the archive, about that community. Who are the four key parts? And the reason that these are really important concepts are because the thread, they are a thread that goes through archive service accreditation and particularly through the collections development um, process. Because we're not requiring you to do everything the same if you are a small charity or a large company. Everything is driven by the mission of your organisation and the community that you are, are constituted to serve. So if you are entirely internally focused, you'll be wanting to act in a different way on your collections development than if you are um, um, mainly externally focused. So just to give you two definitions there, it's really important when you think about community to remember as well that the the the, the community doesn't necessarily uh, refer to just a population of a political unit or a physical area. It's beyond the formal um, unit of your organisation, and it's going to be multiple. There can be multiple areas. Also important to remember that community includes both stakeholders and users. So it's not just people that use your collections. 
So you can see how both these concepts and an understanding of them are really quite vital to a collections development. The other set of concepts that's really important to um, collections development is plans, policies and procedures and how these are defined. And it's always really important, as it is with any management speak, to have what you mean by these words very clear in your mind. So when you have look at archive service accreditation, you will see that these words are repeated in the structure throughout. Um, and today we're talking about a policy um, and having that definition clear in your mind is really important. So we're going to have a quick quiz now. Um, there are no prizes, but I believe there might be a leaderboard. I've not done quizzes before on this, so, so we, will, we will see. Um, if I move us on to the next slide on Mentimeter then. Oh, there we go. Question one of three. Here we go. Oh. No, that is not what I put on this slide. Uh, we did not have a whole load of... Oh. Well, that's very annoying. Just let me see if I can get that back up. Hold on, just give me a second. The technology never works, does it? Okay, let me see. <laughs> okay. Okay, if I show you that now, if I just share, uh, 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 my screen. Okay, so brilliant. You've, you've managed to get through it, even though I didn't, uh, wasn't able to show you the screen. It just get through that. Brilliant. Okay, so you it obviously came up on your on your devices. <laughs> even though I couldn't show it to you on the screen. So brilliant me for working that out. Um, which description best defines the policy? So a policy describes the overall intentions and direction of an organisation or service. Policy describes the outputs the organisation will achieve. That's a bit of a, it's a close run thing between those two, but policy is a document written to prove, to please management and get accreditation. Very pleased that nobody asked, answered that one. I'm gonna try and move us on to the next question now. Okay. Question two of three. Okay, so the question should be on your other devices. What is a plan? Does it describe how an organization will achieve an outcome? Does it list what an organization will do? Um, oh, I will try and rerun that. So there we go, sets out the objectives and identifies the actions needed to achieve this. Again, there's a really cl close in the definition between two of those descriptions of a plan. It does describe how the organization will achieve an outcome, but it's about setting out those objectives and those actions needed. So it's about the, the flow from the policy to the objectives through the actions. That's what's really quite important. Okay, I'm about to send you on to the next and final quiz question. Um, it's obviously not gonna give you very time, so very much time. So on your marks, get set. 
Um, question three, which I'm sure you can guess it's going to be, what is a procedure? Which best describes a procedure? Is it a specified way to carry out a process or activity? Is it a list of activities you have to deliver to achieve the plan? Or is this an operation qualified, carried out by a qualified surgeon? It is a quali operation qualified by a qualified surgeon. Yeah, it's a specified way to carry out an activity or a process. Oh, I think. Brilliant, okay. Some of you did very well. <laughs> if you want to see the leaderboard. Okay to go back to the sensible things, sensible part of the, 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 the uh, presentation. It's really important to think about those processes because having a real clarity in your mind by what archive service accreditation means by this will help us. A policy is about this overall intention and direction. It's about a strategic um, way. These are the definitions that archive service accreditation uses. And the important thing for me is that the policy leads onto the plan, leads onto the procedure. These should be really tied together. The policy is a strategic intention. The plan is the practical application of that policy. And the other really important thing that, that people forget is that it should be signed, that it should be dated. Gosh, we're archivists, we're archive professionals, we should remember that. And that it should show who it was improved by, that it should be approved and that it should have a review date. It sounds straightforward, but these are the things that I often see that people have forgotten. So what's the purpose of a collections development policy? As I say, it's about describing that strategic approach. It's about tying in what you do in terms of collections development with the mission of your organisation. So I have a client at the moment who, um, you know, they, the, the main part of their work is to run a, a nature reserve. This is their chance to show in the collections development policy why what they do ties in to that work. A collections development policy can bring together disparate documents and make sure that they're knit together to, to effectively. Um, it's really important to say that there isn't one correct way to write a collections development policy. And, and that's why I'm not gonna give you a list of headings today. I'm just gonna give you a methodology because it should be bespoke to your organization and, and your circumstances. It should then therefore provide the team with a really effective tool to direct your work. It's worth putting the, the work in so that it then becomes a document that can be um, delivered, that, that will assist staff as they're working. Um, it makes sure that you know that management have basically got your back. We talked last time about, um, you know, making sure that you've got approval so that if you ever have to stand up in a courtroom and justify what you've done, you can do that. Um, it provides staff with support for their actions in deaccessioning and disposal in particular. And if you're a public facing service, it, it guides the public on what your policy is. I found it invaluable over the years to be able to say, no, I'm sorry, we don't collect that. It's not part of our collecting policy. I mean, TNA talks about, TNA, the National Archives guidance on this issue talks about the benefits of collections development policy being selection. So guidance for staff on selecting and deselecting material and um, reducing personal bias, really important by setting those individual decisions within a scope and context of the whole collection and within the scope and context and the mission of the organisation. 
It also helps to identify gaps within the collection, ensuring consistency and continuity, really, in decision making. Um, it also, the guide, TNA guidance also talks about planning, providing a firm basis for future planning. So it will help you to determine those future priorities and to assess collection strengths. And finally, the National Archives guidance talks about um, communications. So it's a really good way to communicate with parental organization, users and funding bodies through your collection development policy. And that's why it's really useful to remember that the language of your policy should reflect the audience needs. You might even have two versions. There might be a, a basic version that you, you use in public and there might be a more detailed internal document that you use. Um, and it doesn't have to be one document, but they must tie together. OK. It's also really important to get a team in place to help to develop and deliver a policy. You know, this isn't a one man band. And even if you are a one man sole record keeping organisation, there will be within others within your organisation who have an interest in what is collected, how it's collected, what is deaccessioned, how it's managed, what information you collect. Um, it, this really helps you to ensure that you're covering all the bases and that the policy is deliverable. Another pair of eyes, that's often what I'm able to provide in my work. It also means that the team's got a stake in the policy and it's more likely to be delivered well. So developing a policy is also an opportunity really to bring in maybe complementary services, to learn from others and to engage in uh, senior managers. So there's a range of different um, people that you might want to involve in your um, um, uh, developing your policy. So on Menti now, I've moved the slides on. It'd be really interesting to hear who you would develop in you, who you would involve in developing your collections development policy. So if you want to add in those on the, the menti.com now, and um, we might come up with some good ideas that other people could share. Great. OK. Senior management. Yeah. Head of the library. We've got data protection officer, legal services. Yeah. Uh, archives team, librarian, archive committee. I'm presuming that's an external committee, which is a really useful. Um, yeah, it's interesting whether you would you involve members of the public and users in in that curator so i'm improved you know complementary services um archivists um head of service and um, colleagues in museums some of those colors are dreadful on my screen local studies ed education and outreach um we've got finance director university executive um we've got our team legal external subject experts really good idea especially if it's an area that you um you know you don't know an, a lot about or you're new to to the sector in that uh, looking at that area so there's a good list of different types of people there that you might want to um involve in your um and collections development policy. I think it's really useful to get that team together. And in projects where I have involved a team in developing this policy, it's always been stronger than, than, than when it's been one person alone. Okay, thank you for sharing those with us there. Okay, 
So now we've got those foundation concepts in place, let's start to try and get practical. What areas of collection of work does collection development include? What are the areas we would um, recognise as long standing? Um, as a profession, we've We've moved towards a more proactive role in managing records, partly driven by technology and partly driven by a recognition that archival holdings were overtly concerned with the lives of the rich, the famous of the ordinary, with white section, sections of the population over black and ethnic minority sections and a whole host of other biases. Collections development policies and plans are therefore a key way to remove these imbalances and create a more representative history. I'm going to use this collection as an example of how I've undertaken this work before. This is, or this was, because it's not in those boxes now, the um, Tottenham Hotspur collection. Um, we, we, we use the term heritage assets, mix of archive and objects that I helped to develop um, over an 18 month period a couple of years ago. So I'll use some examples from that as we go forward. I've divided the steps that I usually follow in collecting and developing a collecting policy into, into these five steps, starting with the story and context collecting, collections knowledge and review, the sort of priorities and limitations for collecting um, and accessioning and disposal. Um, I can't see chat at the moment, so I'm hoping that um, if you make any chat, it should just pop up, but any questions you have as you go along. Um, I've also given you um, a link to um, a table that I usually use when I'm doing a review. Um, it just helps me to, over, uh, to, to uh, have an overview of where people, where, where projects are up to, where organisations are up to in developing their policy. Um, I've given you a download address there. It wasn't working last time I checked on my website, apologies. But if you want to make a note of that and I will make sure that it works, it's at the, the hosting end, not, not at my end, unfortunately. But it's it's just a useful table to, to make a note of the area of work, what you've already got in place, what you need to work on and who's responsible. And as we go through these next few pages of, of, of discussion, you might find it useful to have a look at um, and make some notes of each in each of those. So for um, the Spurs archive, oh, the download's working now, thank you um, for checking that. Um, first spares, the, the language we used was really, throughout was really important. Um, the, the management of the club didn't want to use archival language, so we didn't use it. And the policies were written in the language they understood. So I used the words heritage assets and language around control and efficiency and effectiveness. They were keen that the collection became a really strong resource for the commercial and community activities. So this was important to them as well. And referring back to the mission of the club, not on the pitch, because that's something that I've got no control over, but to have an economically sound business grounded in its local community, referring back to that mission throughout was really important. So they talked about having the, guard, the archive as the guardian of the past and the future history of the club you know they they talked about having them you know quite clearly um uh expressed okay moving on then to talk about um yeah moving on to talk about um the context and talking about why, in this section, why collections development is important and how it supports the mission of the service. In each section, I'm going to give you a little set of questions to, 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 to talk about. And um, 
you might want to think about in this section how you'll use this policy, what and who it will influence. How will this policy influence or impact on other work? It's vital in this bit to talk about the history of collecting in your institution. So in the Spurs work, um, the collection had been gathered over a 30, 40 year period by the club historian and had been placed in one place. It had grown really through his, through his, through his efforts entirely. And then through the stadium move, it had become um, uh, something that they needed to, de to deal with. Um, and um, something that they needed to really, they wanted to um, uh, um, care for in, a, in, a, in an improved way. So the history of collecting can be really quite important. What's the legislative and legal environment you work in? So what are your restrictions? What are you directed by? What is the minute that allows you to collect? What is the um, charitable objective? That, that says that you can collect archives? What enables you to do that? What are the restrictions on your collecting? Um, what sort of ethical codes do you follow? On what basis do you collect? You know, the methods of collection development should be ethical and responsible and in line with the statutory context that covers archives and cultural property. So the sort of things that might involve is the spoilation of works of art during the Holocaust and World War II period. Um, the UNESCO 1970 Convention on the Pro Prohibiting and Preventing Illicit Import, Export and Transport Fair of Cultural Property. It might also include professional codes of ethics, such as those by the International Council on Archives and ARA. It's really important to, to, to explain in that ethical code section which of those you, you, you follow. Um, what gaps do you know? What gaps do you have in your collecting? What impact do these gaps have? You know, it's no, no point just saying, yeah, we, we don't have enough um, from um, former players. You know, we don't have enough on the fans' experience. We need to know what impact these gaps have. Um, for what are the issues you have with unappraised collections and what's awaiting deaccessioning and disposal? For, for us at Spurs, it was really important for us to clarify op overlaps with local museums, national football museums, and with certain private collections. Um, we had a simple but a very, a very typically ambitious collecting statement that our ambition was to preserve the best football archive in the world-class facility. So your statement should result from a review of the previous statement. When you're thinking about what your collecting statement should be, you need to think about what's worked and what hasn't, what has changed, what results, um, what hasn't changed. You need to have that collecting policy statement as a result from discussions with other organisations, internal body. At a very basic level, you need to be describing the geography, the time period, the subject, the sector, all these sorts of things. You might also want to be highlighting what the omissions should be. So perhaps you don't collect film, you refer it to local film archive. Perhaps you have an agreement with a local local other locality that they cover one area pre-74 when local government changes, perhaps. Or it could be an issue of language. You might also want to describe how the material enters the archive. So are you only taking um, internal transfers? Do you buy material? Do you only take external donations? And um, it was really important for us at, at Tottenham to describe that we don't buy material. Um, it, that was really quite important for us to, to state that. And then to talk about that role of 
ethics and responsible collecting. Clarity here is really important. So we talked about not collecting scrapbooks and newspaper cuttings unless they belonged to our referenced individuals of significance to the club. Um, so that clarity is really quite important. Moving on then to collections knowledge and review. How are you going to intend to build your knowledge of collections and how are you going to go through a review process? We're going to have a case study today that talks about building that collections knowledge and we're going to look in some more detail next week at the sort of review tools that you can use. But you might want to start here from an overview of what you hold already. How do the collect, what areas do the collections you have now cover? And then comparing that to the collecting remit that you've got proposed. Do you know enough about your collections? Lots of organisations don't. Do you need to review that? And then identifying and sharing here where the gaps are in collections. Are the media you can no longer care for? And then for the institutional archive, it's really important to say, how far does your collection reflect the corporate memory? You know, that's a really strong question to ask, a really important question to ask. For spares, we, there was a massive survey of the collections and the various lists that existed and the complementary collections everywhere. And that was fed into the collections development process. Number four then, step four looks at the priorities and the limitations for, collect, for collecting. These should be clearly linked to the previous areas of discussion. So you are highlighting what those priorities are from the mission to the community, to the gaps, to the knowledge that you have, and therefore our priorities for collecting our are this. And then you also have to show the other side, which areas are not a priority. And you might look at deaccessioning. You know, there's you know, got to be really ruthless these days about what you, what you store, what you pay to store and being able to justify that's important. So you can see in this um, little, little diagram on the right, the, the sort of, um, a plan that we had at Spares, which was that the, the archive consisted mainly of administrative items and objects and gifts. And therefore, the priorities that we had were things like individual player and staff records, the filling in the gaps in our match day programmes, women's football, which was a clear gap. And then our priorities for deaccessioning were gifts, there's lots of gift giving in football uh, among clubs, um, getting rid of duplicates and not storing photographs which are held by an agency. Um, but just to give you a bit of an, an overview there of what we did. Okay, I'm going to split us now into um, breakout rooms just really quickly um, for about five minutes. And what I'd like you to just share that back again. Uh, what I'd like you to be thinking about in these rooms is what your top priorities are for collecting and deaccessioning, and and how have you decided that? Um, what what is your plan? What is your what are your top priorities? I think it's really useful to have that discussion with other people that are here in the group. So I'm going to just send you for about 10 minutes to, um, to some breakout rooms. We've got, um, probably send you to, uh, uh, probably about four of you in each individual breakout room um, and, and send you to those. Give you about 10 minutes to work, to have a discussion um, and then come back. If you can nominate one of your group as a scribe, um, and then we can come back um, and have a discussion about what you have found through the chat box. That would be brilliant.
Okay, thank you. Great. I think we've almost got everybody back. Um, I can just still see room five chatting um, and a few in room four, but hopefully you found that useful to explore in a little bit more detail what's going on in other locations. Um, I think a few people have dropped in and out. So let me just see. We've still got a few in the waiting room. Um, but if you want to add what you found in the chat box, that will be really useful. I think we've got everybody back now. Yeah, brilliant. OK. Um, I popped into a couple of the different um, uh, discussions, some really interesting comparisons, different types of organisations. Um, one um, question was asked um, just before we went into the breakout room about collections development in terms of what you collect and what you don't collect. And this is a, um, a question from Continental Europe um, where they've witnessed a few regional archives where they have the practice of receiving a donation of material and only keeping from it what's relevant to that region, which seems to go against the principle of archival integrity. It's really made me think this one. And she's asking what are the current British standards regarding this aspect for accredited archives? On the top of my head, I can't think what what accreditation says about that. I'd need to go away and look at it in detail. If anyone else can can add that in or add their uh, viewpoint, I mean, every case is different, isn't it? However, I think art archival integrity is so important. Um, there are cases where it does happen in this country. So, uh, you know, there are national archives collections that would be better used in the locality and therefore they're transferred there. Um, but I, I wouldn't say it would be um, unusual for that to happen. So for example, an estate archive would normally go to where the main, where main land of the state is based, despite it having materials from a variety of different places. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I will certainly have another little look at that one. But yeah, if you want to add in the chat, um, we've got some 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 feedback there um, going forward. Just share a few more screen, um, slides with you before I go forward and hand over to um, the, the the guys from. Uh, Edinburgh. Okay then, so step five then, we've we've looked at our reviews, we've looked at our gaps. Step five then thinks about the accessioning, the deaccessioning and the disposal um, areas. And we've, we've, we've started to talk about that in some of the groups that I've been involved. You need to be thinking about what is your, what is your approach? How will you decide on how to accession? material or whether to, who has the final decision? What is your process for deaccessioning? When I've worked um, on a regular basis in a local authority archives, we haven't often had a process for deaccessioning, probably should have had one. Are there conditions for accessioning materials? You know, really useful to have those clearly written. So you might say, we'll own accession things that have a clear and recorded ownership. What are the ethical considerations? Um, do you require intellectual property rights for all collections? Um, I've put a note there on um, the link to the accessioning guidance from the UK National Archives. For example, do you have a collections panel which considers offers of material on a regular basis? It's useful to, to, to outline that so that frontline staff are not under pressure. Um, it might be helpful to um, outline your approach to offers, including expected timetable to respond or cross refer to different information for depositors. If you have a handling collection, which some organisations do, which is not intended for permanent preservation, it's useful to explain how that relates to your accessioning and on the basis to which items are added to that collection. 
Then, as a consultant, the next slide to me is really one of the most important things. What to do once the policy is written. You know, it's the worst thing in the world to write a policy and for it to sit on a shelf. You need to secure approval. And then you need to plan what your review date is. It could be that you think that should be about three to five years. And um, you need to continue that policy, that process of developing knowledge and then use that knowledge to direct a series of processes. You know, do you need more collections of views? Um, then leading that to develop your collections development plan that we'll talk about having that improving, approved, and then that feeds back into the implementation of the delivery plan. I'm gonna pass over now, if the guys from Edinburgh are almost ready, and um, I'll give them a notice to this, what I'm hoping will be a really useful and fascinating um, talk about the work that they've been doing. Um, I know that they've, they've, I've worked with them over a number of years now, um, and I'm really pleased to be able to share what they've, they've been up to. So I'll stop sharing, and hopefully, Lorraine, you'll be able to, 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 yeah, take, take the mantle. <laughs> um, so I just simply need to share my screen with my PowerPoint. Is that right? Yeah. If you press okay. share screen. Yeah. Okay. You should have all the rights you need. Okay. Brilliant. If you press slideshow, brilliant. Fantastic. We can see that fine. Okay. I'm just going to check that it, how do I, oh, it's moving forward. That's perfect. Okay. Thank you for letting me uh, focus on that for a moment. Um, so my name is Lorraine McLaughlin and I'm appraisal and collections review archivist at the Centre for Research Collections at University of Edinburgh. I'll be doing the first half of this uh, presentation and then our cataloguing archivist uh, Aline Bourdain is going to take over and do the second half and we are very happy to take questions or even advice at the end of this so um, please do ask any questions um, as we go along. Um, just briefly, I should say the Centre for Research Collections at the University, which Janice is very familiar with, um, and her colleagues, uh, colleague Alex, um, is um, a, a, it's, a, it's a great resource for the university, but crucially it's slightly different to um, maybe some other institutions in that all our heritage collections are uh, managed out of the Centre for Research Collections so that um, in this one area, we're all working together, like the rare books librarians, the curators um, of art and music, and um, project archivists as well as core archivists as well. And the, uh, the idea is that because so many of our collections overlap and have different items uh, spanning across those different areas, that researchers can come to this kind of one-stop shop and get uh, uh, the attention and advice of whatever professional is needed as well as the type of material that is linked between those different areas. Um, so in terms of developing knowledge of our collections, um, I just want to give a kind of a brief overview of the incentive behind that and the, the, the journey or the pathway to that, which really started with that archive accreditation process that uh, Janice was talking about. So back in 2015, um, the CRC was awarded archive accreditation status for the first time. Um, so uh, across the board, many of the cr criteria that were necessary for that were obviously met, but as part of the award, we got some re required actions as well. And so the three outstanding for that were that there, there was, it was necessary to focus on a complete uh, collections review and mapping of, of, of the collections across the board. Um, to find out what collection, what level of collections were catalogued to and what resources um, or action plans were needed to, to be put in place. Um, the second required action was to have a dedicated um, um, cataloging archivist who could address the, the, the huge backlog that had, had built up. Um, it's, there is a backlog in every organisation, so we're happy to say that because it is so hard to get full processing done that you know, it's a it's kind of a fact of life for archives. So um, we were aware that that would be there. Um, 
and then the third required action was to was to really implement proposals that the CRC had outlined in their um, uh, accreditation process to focus on data gathering and the, the kind of data gathering that would lead to good analysis so that again so that we could have the kind of um, reporting that would mean we could direct resources where needed. Um, so that was back in 2015. The first thing that our archives manager Rachel Hosker did was uh, commission Dana Sullick and uh, associates to do this logjam report, which is absolutely instrumental in what's been happening in the years since then. Um, so the what Janice looked at was kind of a, a, a really good, a, um, an, a bespoke database, but an overview across the collections of really um, high level information, like what the level of cataloging logging was, what the need for appraisal was, whether there was good information about the collections that were represented there, or whether deeper processing was needed. Um, and crucially as well, what kind of, uh, priority collections or significant collections were, were currently hidden that needed to be revealed um, and might be waiting, have been waiting for years for um, processing. So it was on the back of the lockdown report that um, uh, myself uh, as an appraisal, appraisal and collections review archivist was appointed and also Alin um, as cataloging archivist. So Alin has been working away as uh, for the past four years on, you know, dealing directly with that backlog of, of um, cataloging, mostly with donations and also with merged institutions and dealing with you know, um, new, new accessions mostly as well. But of course, our work really crosses over quite a lot because um, in my appointment, I was looking kind of more towards uh, the legacy collections and seeing what we had, revealing that information and uh, proposing next actions basically and I was taken on as part of a much larger rationalization project across the library so there were thousands of meters of shelving of general collections special collections and archives um, assessed during that whole process and during that project without really you know we, we I took uh, basic collection and information collection management information but also space information uh, you know how much space was being taken up and how it was being used so that even by logging and kind of listing what the collections were and what was on the shelf we were able to save nearly two kilometers of space in in two years so really it was really helpful to have the listing done and collection management information collected so, just so we could make changes to how things were stored so this next slide is just a really quick example of our basic collect collection review uh, template that we developed, kind of um, trying to make sure that we had that basic archival record. So the fields there can be used to populate catalog records, um, or you, the sheet can be used itself as a catalog record if necessary for for um, collections that haven't got full processing. But crucially, it's it's also for us for the archives team and other um, collection managers around the CRC to see what kind of um, state the collection is in, what kind of status it has. And some of the really um, important fields besides the kind of basic archival ones that we've looked at are trying to give an initial appraisal decision based on really um, kind of high level um, assessment of, of appraisal categories. So as you can see the color coded areas there for um, retain, review, and dispose, you probably can't see, but it's the blue, green, and uh, red boxes there. And it's basically if we're just going flying through shelves and trying to see what's there, that we can give a quick decision about whether something should be retained or maybe looked at um, later down the line, reviewed. Um, and all of the kind of review categories, uh, appraisal categories, have different actions that come out of those. And crucially, as well, we also worked with conservation to make sure the criteria about housing and preservation treatment and the time that that would take and everything was added into the review process. I have some other photographs there of uh, um, uh, Aline and another colleague working on an analog collection that had been completely unprocessed since 1988, a really important collection. We did a collection review, we're still not finished it, but even the information we have from half of that review has led to a project proposal and that's now you know, in the works. It's, um, finally coming to fruition 
hopefully this year or next year, depending on what's possible with lockdown and everything. Um, but also we, I have some shots there of discs and magnetic tapes that we come across. And the, the reason I put those there is to say, with the review, it's as basic and broad as possible so that if you do come across something, if we do come across something that we can't, we don't know the content of and we don't know what to do with, we just say what we see and we move on so that we can at least have an overview and remember what we've seen and kind of be able to go back to that location if necessary with that next action. And also the final thing is the final image is just of a, one of our web pages because we're now using the review to log our web estate, which is a massive endeavor but the web state and also digital collections uh, that um, are, are coming in, especially if they're hybrid or mixed. So we'll, uh, we're, we're trying to figure out that mix between um, getting files in that are related to objects or, or, or physical items and how we, we, the, the, the review is kind of linchpin for that at the moment. Um, so before I move on to, on to um, what, um, Ali is going to speak now in a couple of minutes, but basically what we found is that we're at the point now, after nearly four years, uh, we're, we're four years uh, working on this, but um, I was seconded for one year away, so we were only communicating really rarely about it. But basically, uh, we're finding that the, the, the real benefit of um, collecting this data in this way is that we're using it, the rest of the team are using it, the rest of, our, of the CRC are using it when necessary, uh, so with other collections, and also, donors and administrators and people who may want to donate to the archive this is the this is the template that we give them and we talk them through it and the idea is that we have a joint literacy a joint visual understanding of the kind of information we're getting from donors and we're getting from other colleagues so that we can really quickly um make decisions about what's uh, uh, what's possible for the collections so aline is now going to take over and talk through how We've added um, a ratings process to the collection review, again, trying to keep everything in one area. Um, and the ratings process has been quite developed. Um, it's still in development, but yeah, it's getting more detailed. So Aline is going to talk. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. So um, I'm going to go over our methodology. So that's to say the steps we'll follow to use the collection review and the ratings to tackle the, the backlog. Then I'll talk about the ratings a bit more in detail and how we develop them. And finally, I'll briefly highlight the immediate benefits of the whole process. So we are planning to, oops, um, yeah, this one, thank you. Uh, <laughs> we are planning to follow several steps that will enable us to identify and process high priority and catalog collections. So we're going to start by doing a high level collections review. So collection with a, with a S because it's going to be a review of all of our and catalog collections. So we already have a very valuable list, of course, uh, thanks to the Logjam report that Lorraine mentioned earlier. And we're also going to include all the uncatalog collection that we acquired by the university since the report was done. Uh, so this massive review will, will include sorry, um, very high level information like uh, in a spreadsheet with basically one row per collection. And then we will get this information into our online cataloging and collection management system archive space and add ratings uh, in Archive Space, add rating there. Um, at the end, we'll ask Archive Space to produce a, an assessment report in a spreadsheet format, which will include for each collection a single carefully thought out priority score resulting from the addition of all the, the ratings. Uh, and then this will make the identification and selection of high priority collection quite straightforward, hopefully. And then we will be able to start in-depth collection review for each collection uh, at the appropriate level. So either box, uh, file or item, depending on the collection. So uh, next slide, please. So our rating and criteria, I'm going to talk a little bit more in details how we ended up with this. Uh, so the criteria we have chosen are based on a number of, of, of systems. So the main three being the Logjam report, archive space, and uh, in-house criteria that we uh, based on the university's strategic plan and our own professional um, expertise or perspective, let's say. So uh, next slide, next slide, please. Uh, so we are using the Logjam report, which includes a number of very important priority criteria and rating that you can see here on the slide. So we are going to keep this and we are going to keep the priority score, priority score for each collection. However, we will have to tweak them a little bit 
to adapt them to our final ratings and to archive space. So, for example, the in the report, the scores go from zero to 120, I think, uh, whereas on archive space, they only go from one to five. So basically, we'll have to do a bit of mathematical conversion and things like that. So it's just to make things simpler and to end up with one single rating score per collection, just one single number. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, space. So it's a great cataloging manage um, and management system that we started to use in 2015. Uh, it's a very rich tool and we are still exploring the new ways to make good use of it. Uh, so we only recently started using the assessment function, which is which is great. So it means we can attach an assessment record to each accession or resource. And this record includes rating fields uh, that you can see on this slide. They are properly defined. So if you hover over them, uh, archive space gives you a definition. And you can also add your own notes under each field. It's very handy. And one uh, another very good advantage is that you can add as many criteria as you'd like, and that's precisely what we're going to do. Uh, so next slide. Thank you. Um, so our in-house criteria are based, as I said, on the university strategic plan and also our own professional perspective. So these criteria have been tailored to, to suit the need of our service. Uh, so based on our experience, like for three and four years uh, at the CRC. So they are rating from one to five, and each rating um, as a precise definition created by myself and Lorraine, and that we will, of course, submit to the rest of the team. Uh, so I'm going to talk to a, about a few ones, for example, so physical condition, which is a classic one, I would say, but it's quite tailored to what we know about our collection and the kind of what they need, basically. Um, potential gain of space is also an important one for us because we are running out of space actually. And we know that through rehousing um, mainly and cataloging of some collection would be able to gain a lot of space. So we, we made that um, a priority criteria. Uh, existing visibility, it's another one that we came up with. It basically means that we have uh, high profile collections which are known by researchers, but which don't really have um, really good, well, they have pro prob problematic finding aids, I would say, so incomplete or misleading finding aids. So it creates a lot of problems when they're requested um, for us. So that's why we, we made that um, a priority score. Uh, collection gaps, including climate change and decolonizing diversity and inclusion, these are also important. So I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about this later. Uh, and then we've got more classic ones like uh, data protection issues and digital potential. So it could be for aesthetic value or remote access or um, conservation concerns and, and things like that. Um, so next slide, please. So uh, one of our criteria, as I said, is a collection gap. So this one is quite important because not only will it help us to prioritize uncatalogued and thus invisible uh, collections that contain crucial and underrepresented material, but it will, it will also help us identify what we are missing currently from our collection. Um, so one kind of gap is when some important themes, individuals or communities are underrepresented or misrepresented in the archive, because for example, of um, older or non-updated acquisition policy, so we have chosen to emphasize two uh, for now. So climate change, so a collection that would aid climate change research and community engagement. But we are also aware that the whole process of um, reviewing a collection and, and rehousing and cataloging will also have an impact for that. For example, uh, offering remote access and uh, decreasing the space some collection take. Uh, and another one is decolonizing and the diversity and inclusion. So that's material produced by or related to underrepresented or misrepresented communities, and also material crucial for other countries underrepresented history. So these can be institutional records or donated funds. But in terms of collection gaps, we place a great importance on institutional records since our primary objective and function is to maintain the records of the University of Edinburgh itself. So therefore, highest priority gaps are the gaps in the Edinburgh Uni archives. So either gaps in the scope of the records, so for example, missing departmental records, or gaps in its history, 
So when the history um, of the university cannot be accounted for. So making sure this uh, field uh, justifies giving a higher priority score to this category of collections. Um, and we also need to make sure that we are not creating future gaps uh, by neglecting newer fields of study at the university, such as uh, digital humanities, information technology, gender studies, social sciences, etc. So therefore, to know what is lacking in our institution, institutional records, we have started a survey of what the university has been offering during the last 70 years in terms of degrees and courses, for example, to identify newer areas that don't necessarily have an existing relationship with the archive. And next slide, please. So this whole process uh, hopefully will make selecting collections to work on in priority straightforward. But as explained earlier, uh, the plan is not to start cataloging them right away. So we don't have enough time, we don't have enough staff. So first we'll create these uh, collection reviews and these will have uh, immediate benefits. So obviously it's going to create or improve existing finding aids. Uh, it's gonna make access easier through physical and intellectual control. So I'm thinking, for example, of locations. So location in the source, but also location within the collection. Um, it's gonna give us a better understanding of data protection issues. Um, and it's gonna help us identify specific rehousing priorities and identify potential appraisal projects. But also an, another important one is that it's going to give us a better starting point for application to externally funded uh, cataloging projects. So basically by knowing what's in our collection and knowing why they are or not important, we, we will know, we will be ready every time there's like funding coming up or a potential project. So we'll be ready to apply and we'll have data uh, to back it up. Um, so I'll just um, end briefly that by saying that we have assessed the use potential of this whole process and especially the archive space assessment function. And it's usually useful, um, but we have decided for now to limit it to legacy material and to use it as a tool to tackle a backlog of uncatalogued collections, which is our priority. But in the future, we might ap apply it to new accessions, although the process and perhaps some rating might need to be tweaked a little bit for the purpose. Uh, so I will just hand over briefly to Lorraine for our conclusion. Thanks. Um, thanks, Ali and Janice. Are we okay for time? Will I just say? Yeah, that's, that's fine. That's fine. That's okay. Basically, yeah, we just wanted to wrap up by saying we're very aware that the process that we've shown you uh, seems quite, you know, um, pernickety and detailed and a lot of box ticking and trying to, you know, get everything into um, a spreadsheet and really the main focus is actually not to um, give uh, collections a score and that be it, but to try and uh, comment at every stage that we can on why why material is in our collection and why we're you know uh, deciding to make changes along the way. So another generation of archivists in 20, 30, 50 years may make different decisions and we're hoping that this kind of documentation will help them to develop the collections further. And everybody's aware of this really famous statement from literature, but also from Twitter. Uh, at the moment, uh, archives are not neutral. We, uh, as a team, were really aware of this uh, statement. And really, it, it's part of our ethos now as well, because we regularly discuss the fact that we can try and be objective in terms of standards, et cetera. But we know that we're not neutral, and that if we want to redress the kind of leaning towards certain collections, we need to have this kind of data to back up our requests to get funding and time to, to really um, process and uh, make visible in collections that are currently missing from, from, from view, basically. So that's where we are at the moment. Um, we still have loads to do. We'd appreciate any feedback from anybody. And of course, we'll take any questions anybody has either here in the, in, in the webinar, but also at any stage, if anyone wants to get in touch. Okay. Thank you. That was that's really really useful. It's useful for me to know where, where you've where you've gone since I since I last work, worked with you and, and and how it's progressed. And I think one of the things I would say to people is this is such a useful process of reviewing collections in a variety of different ways. And I don't want people to think that this is a four year project. 
you know, the logjam project, it's about your, your being applicable to your scale. The logjam project, for example, that looked at the un, uncatalogued collections, that, um, that took two of us 10 days. We're quick though, we are quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've done it a lot. So it might take you a bit longer, but you know we're not we're not talking about unlimited amounts amounts of time there. I think um, there's a really good question here um, in the chat, guys, um, saying what is what what are your tips really for balancing this this legacy work with with current accessions and activities? Yeah, really good point. Um, will I take that for a second, Eileen, yeah. and then you can jump in as well. Um, we, we've talked about this a lot, an awful lot, and basically uh, one of the most important things is our relationship, as in we work so closely together that we make sure that we know what each other are doing in terms of documentation so that we're trying to, you know, get that consistency across the board. But so crucially, what is what we found from reviewing the legacy collections now feeds into how Aline uh, decides to accession material and what acquisitions come in. Um, and it's really, yeah, trying to, 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 to marry what is being documented with the legacy collections um, with the processes that we've developed so that it doesn't happen again. So the, back, the backlog is kind of, the, it's a stop the rot situation where we, anything that's newly accessioned gets uh, treated in a, in, in a way that's review-like. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a really good question. And I think we... We talked about it a lot because I remember complaining that I didn't have the time. We didn't have the time because everything was getting in the way and everything. So I think it's also a matter of just making time for it. Blocking, I would block my, we would block our calendars. It's like no meeting, we're working on this and make people understand uh, that it's actually, even if, you know, they say it's legacy material and it's like, oh, it's been waiting for years. So it's not going to go anywhere. Well, actually it, it's, it's really important Urgent. and, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's urgent and we need to spend time doing this because this is core work and the more we work on it, the, the more, the easiest it'll be for a, for a job in the future. So, yeah, yeah, I'd say just, just explain and push back and say how important it is, even though it's legacy material. Yeah, um, we're not going to finish it. We, we actually realise that we're not going to finish it, but what we've done is make a start. And if people take on this process, there'll be hopefully over time a good body of work. Uh, whether it's us or or somebody in the future that does it, so you can only make a start and do your best, you know, to get as much data as possible. Yeah, I, I would say it's also very helpful because when we started, we had fixed time contracts, so two years and a half. Was One it? year for me. One year. So it really helped that we got made uh, permanent. We had a permanent contract, so now yeah. we can think in the long term. Um, well. Absolutely, and that's the thing as well, because the, the initial report um, is allowed there to be a project then, you know, to several different projects to see what we could do with it. And actually the, the, the service then has found the data collection and the new processes so useful that we're now part of the core team just doing appraisal review and uh, uh, cataloging um, and working together on that. So uh, it started off just as project and now it's core. I think, I think my, my tip would be that to realize that actually uh, you could be store paying to store materials that you would otherwise deaccession if you hadn't developed this knowledge and if you actually sit down and even try to estimate how much that's costing yeah it could be frightening and, I, and never mind what other impacts it's having on you so yeah i always come back to the to, to them to the cost because Absolutely. It, it's um it's a, a, a false economy there's a there's a question here about um the digital humanities and do you have systems in place to harvest web-based projects from students and teachers and researchers uh yes we do now again in their infancy these different tools and uh, there's over the past few years, I'm part of the um, archive of accreditation suggestions for improved actions um, were um, focusing on digital di digital acquisitions. So uh, there's a digital archivist appointed as well and um, um, a newer one um, just um, during lockdown. Um, and what we've been able to do because of, I mean, in one way, hand, uh, lockdown has been kind of handy this way is we focus much more on developing those tools because we're all working from home. But 
yes, we have we have um, the Archivematica system in the background that's been developed over years to ingest uh, institutional archives. There's, there's, st there's the workflow of how to do that to get it from you know the the computers and the servers of people in departments and schools uh, to us. It's still being worked out, and it's actually it's 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 not a one you know it's there's, there isn't one solution for that. Basically, we still get USB sticks handed into us or boxes full of disks, as well as email attachments. Um, but what we've done is um, we've worked uh, with the UK Web Archive via NLS and Ailey McGill um, mm -hmm. McGlone there to help us um, start using the UK Web Archive curators tool to um, crawl our university web estate. And then we also have uh, um, developed a form that at the moment is specific to collecting information about the experiences of COVID-19 but will become more uh, generalized so that people, if they do have digital submissions that they want to give in to us, they can use the form to attach their digital item. And the form crucially has metadata that we can then use to catalog and to make sure that checksum processes are done and that um, the, the digital material can be put through Archivematica. So it's in a holding space for the moment. But yeah, our we are yeah we're at the start of kind of um, actively going out to people and making contact with them and saying if you like if you'd like to make a digital submission of any size tell us what you've got and we'll try and find a solution and it could be a tool it could be an open source thing it could be the form and we just have to see what what we're dealing with before we we give an answer to that <laughs> but we are doing it <laughs> brilliant thank you it's been it's been really brilliant to hear how this works developed and how it's arisen from an accreditation you know an archive accreditation um process and i think that's really useful to to, sh to share with people you know at the end of that process going through all that development you do get feedback that says this is where we think you should be developing in the future and lots of organizations mm -hmm. have found it really useful in securing internal resources to be able to do this this sort of work so i, I know it's 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 nice to be able to see the story go on to the next next stages so i thank you very much for sharing your your experiences with us today and um, if there are any last questions for, for any of us that then just drop them in the hint and the in the chat but in the meantime i'm just going to give you an idea of what we're going to be doing next time next week i feel like i'm going to be here forever week three and um, we're going to look at the collection development planning in a bit more detail so how might you want to implement the the policy that you've just written and we'll be joined by speakers from the university of nottingham talking about how they've developed collecting programs with their student population and with unilever talking about how they build um, relationships across multinational organizations to bring archives into the organization and into the collection I, I can't imagine how they do that but they have got some really good mechanisms set up that might might work and um, the um there's a comment here about how less resourced archives local authorities could hope to replicate this um, I don't know whether you want to, to, to answer that, Lorraine, and then I'm happy to, to join yeah. in. Just, just to say, um, I, I totally understand that it seems like a big institution like um, Edward University might have kind of refunds the drop of a hat. But really, what we have found that it all comes back to basic data collection with an Excel spreadsheet. I know that sounds really uh, too simple to imagine, but what we've it's again that consistency about how the data is collected and how it's presented to us and how we present it to other people that means that we can go quickly to a collection and say um yes if there's money available uh we have this extent and there are these issues and this resources is needed so we can just um funnel um all the interest towards that particular item or that you know that particular collection but really even though we have plenty of systems in place, uh, it's the collection review that is the linchpin at the moment between all of those systems and actually having a bit that visual literacy, a joint understanding of what's happening in each of those systems. So um, if anybody ever wants to, to talk to me about um, using that 
review it probably would have been better in the next webinar sorry but if anyone does want to talk about that i'm um very open to that well Lorraine, you're the you're the segue to the next um <laughs> uh, webinar you see i think for local authority archives the, 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 there's there's about there's something about making it as simple as possible for it to become part of the accessioning process in some way um and about how making helping to make the case with um uh, governing authorities about investment in this if possible and building it into funding applications even you know that you need to do a review of collections before you go forward um, and again i bring you back to potentially you're storing collections and paying to store collections that you might not keep um, some clients that I've worked with have used this process as preparation towards a building project and um, so being able to prove that everything they have is worth is worth keeping so that they're not building or they're not expanding storage when actually they could not be able to do it um, what you don't want is a new manager to come in and say do we really need to keep that you want to be able to say we've been through this process and yeah. i can show you in a scientific basis that this this is this is what we need to do okay well i don't know about you but i'm getting hungry so <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll i'll thank you all for contributing once again and take playing your part it's all really so much better for me when everyone chats in the chat box shares their questions and their their their, their ideas and um, thank you again to our two speakers and um, lovely to see you guys and, <laughs> and and hopefully see you again next week but yeah. um, any questions you've got in the meantime please send it to me and then you've got in preparation for next week um pop them um, via the contact um, page on my website. But um, take care, everybody, and, and see you again next time. Thanks. Thank you, John. Bye. Thank you.